the key focus of this work is on uh, reinforcement learning and how it could be integrated in the uh, uh, safe way for uh, real world application and a little bit uh, the connection between RL and large language models. So reinforcement learning is a paradigm of uh, decision making when an agent interact with the world, get feedback from the world and take an action. So uh, that's one uh, paradigm of the machine learning. So if you have supervised, unsupervised, RL is uh, one of the big key uh, paradigm of the, R, uh, of the machine learning that help us to make a, a decision, a paradigm of the decision. And uh, uh, in terms of a little bit uh, taxonomy of the RL, so we have some action states and uh, rewards. So agent interacts with the environment, interacts with uh, some world, and uh, world uh, guide, and uh, we uh, take some action in order to accomplish some task or uh, maximize some uh, notion of the board function. That's the whole idea of the reinforcement learning. Uh, learning by uh, trial and error is the key scope of the reinforcement learning. But when we think about the reinforcement learning so far, there are a lot of uh, research uh, in the RL community, but uh, the main scope of those works on, are in a simulated environment. So RL has shown a lot of success in simulated environment. For example, in solving some challenging games, for example, chess, alpha goes, uh, so many things that can be solved uh, by using the RL. So also, uh, there are a lot of work in the area of the healthcare for the RL, uh, such as the protein folding. So we can uh, discover new drug, new formulation for the drug, and uh, those kind of things uh, uh, using the reinforcement learning. So uh, protein folding of the deep mind is uh, one of the main uh, breakthrough to use RL to find the drug structure. And also a lot of work in a simulated environment for the robotics. Uh, have been used uh, uh, for the RL in a simulated environment. But when we think about the reinforcement learning, can we use reinforcement learning in physical world? Or can we get a benefit from RL to solve a real world application problem? Uh, and uh, in that line, uh, there are a lot of work. So uh, uh, for example, we have a lot of work on autonomous driving, still in simulated environment, but uh, we don't have a lot of work that apply reinforcement learning in the physical setup. And also we can think about chat bots. So uh, we are in the foundation model era. So I will uh, a bit, uh, talk about that. And also can we imagine that RL can solve an actual uh, robotic problem in a physical setup in real world. But what is the key issue that we uh, think for RL in a physical world. Let's a little bit uh, review on the challenges of if you wanted to apply RL in physical world, what are the uh, key challenges? So, and uh, that key challenge is safety constraints. So safety constraints are uh, the limitation from the environment. So when you wanted, for example, use RL for autonomous driving, there are a lot of uh, limitations. Uh, especially for robotics applications, self-driving car, and healthcare application. So in general, when we talk about the safety constraint, our goal is to maximize some expected return, but subject to some constraint that comes from the environment, which is the uh, safety constraints. So one of the things that hinders us use RL in the real world setup is the safety constraint, safety issue, and we call those safety critical situations. And I wanted to uh, produce some, I wanted to introduce some examples of safety constraints. For example, autonomous driving, an autonomous car wanted to maximize some notion of the reward function, uh, but subject to some safety constraint. And those safety constraint is uh, traffic rules, speed limits, uh, safe uh, following distance uh, between uh, a go-kart and other vehicles. 
So those are some safety constraints that we can imagine uh, for the autonomous driving application. And also similarly uh, for the robotics, we are interested, for example, to accomplish some task, some robotic task, uh, and also maximize some expected return. But again, we have some uh, safety constraints. So for example, maintain a safety stance from humans and uh, some safety constraints in real world uh, are uh, things that we need to consider. And we are in a foundation model era. So when we talk about the safety constraint in chatbot, uh, we are again interested to uh, generate responses to user prompts. So we are interested to accomplish some good things for us, some uh, maximization of some uh, reward, but there are some safety constraints. And, some, and uh, uh, those safety constraints is we need to avoid that uh, biased response or filter uh, not good text and uh, those kind of the things are safety constraint in the chatbot. And under the hood of large language models, there exists reinforcement learning uh, layer. And also we have a paradigm of the reinforcement learning from uh, feedback. So when uh, chatbot uh, provides you some answer, you, for example, uh, thumbs on, that gives the feedback. And uh, uh, those are some constraints or feedback from human. But when we think about the safety constraints, uh, these safety constraints are kind of known. I mean, uh, we know uh, that what are those safety constraints? We assume that there exists some expert knowledge that can identify for us those safety constraints. So these are uh, uh, the issue of the safety constraint. And in the rest of this talk, I wanted to say that all of those constraint that dictated by a human is not good or cannot help us to apply reinforcement learning in a real world setup. So predefined safety constraints may not be always sufficient in a dynamic environment or safety constraints are kind of subjective. Someone may have some preference for the safety constraint, but uh, from the perspective of the of the other person, that might not be even a safety constraint. So uh, these are some subjective things that cannot be uh, applied from person to person or situation to situation. Uh, and uh, that's the key issue of application of, of RL in a real world setup. So I just wanted to provide some uh, example of the static safety constraint. So, uh, uh, consider some uh, simple environment, uh, those guys that have some uh, background on uh, reinforcement learning have already seen uh, this simple uh, frozen lake environment from Jim. So we have some, uh, we have some agent that uh, wanted to go from A to some uh, target and he or she should avoid some obstacles uh, denoted by the blue dot but over the course of the action, over the course of the environment, these things uh, uh, might be evolved. So we might have additional safety constraints or in the real world, uh, the real world can uh, change from one time to another time. So we might have some uh, big challenge to deal with those obstacles and uh, safety constraints. And uh, that's the problem of safety constraints. And uh, that's why the issue, a big issue of the static safety constraint. So if you remember a 2018 autonomous vehicle, Uber has some accident with a pedestrian and uh, it was very challenging. And uh, uh, people thought that uh, the key issue is uh, reinforcement learning cannot be applied in a real world setup uh, because real world is very, different than a simulated environment. Safety is a big issue. And a static safety constraint that we can define in a simulated environment may not be good uh, to be applied for RL in a real world setup. And actually I was a postdoc at 2019 and at that time at Ford, uh, and I remember Elon Musk told that at 2020, we have a lot of autonomous driving in a road but it was not happening. So we don't have so much autonomous uh, cars in the world. And one of the reasons is heavy tail 
uh, of the rare events. So the key issue that we still do, has, uh, have, do not have uh, those autonomous car in a vehicle is uh, uh, there are a lot of rare events that hinder us to use uh, such a technology. And that's the problem of unknown, unknown uncertainty. So unknown, unknown uncertainty are something that's called the surprise. Uh, mathematically defining the surprise is very challenging for the whole machine learning community. And actually, we don't claim in this talk that you wanted to address that. Say for, it's, uh, actually, it's the effort of the whole community to address that. But uh, the whole scope of this talk is to provide some understanding or some simple solution that if we can address that problem in reinforcement learning setup. So uh, the key theme of my uh, talk for uh, today is how we can deal with the problem of unknown, unknown uncertainty. When we have reinforcement learning, how we can deal with the surprise uh, in the context of the safety critical system. So again, uh, we have a lack of a predefined safety constraint. So in some instances, I just wanted to review what we told so far. In some instances, predefined safety constraint may not be available and impossible to acquire even. So if you have some surprise, how we can uh, tell reinforcement learning agent to deal with those uh, constraints. And in some environments uh, that are unexplored, uh, 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 we have the same issue. So uh, something might happen uh, when you drive and an, an animal comes up and how you how the autonomous agent, how AI wanted to handle those situations, very challenging problem. Environment that are too dangerous to explore. So how we can uh, deal with those constraints. So uh, problem statements, what problem that we are interested to solve or how we can uh, deal with this uh, problem. So uh, we consider the problem of safe reinforcement learning uh, policy synthesis in an environment where safety constraints are not uh, known a priori. So we don't have information about the uh, safety constraints. But we are trying to formulate this problem in a concurrent learning of the po policy and constraints. So we don't know the constraints, we are trying to come up with a policy. So we are trying to jointly optimize the policy and also find the safety constraints. So uh, we are trying to optimize the parameter of the safety specification. So we assume, so we have some assumption to make a progress to problem of unknown, unknown uncertainty. We assume that we have some sense about the uh, safety constraints. We know something about the safety constraint. We do not exactly know what the safety constraint is, uh, but we are trying to jointly optimize uh, those parameters of the safety, safety specification or safety constraint and also find the RL policy. So remember the whole idea of RL is to find a policy that maximizes some notion of the reward. But here, in addition to find the policy, we are trying to learn those safety constraints on the fly. And we hope that by this joint learning of the policy and also the safety constraint, we make some progress to the problem of unknown, unknown uncertainty in the real world setup. So uh, I just wanted to summarize what I told so far. In addition to learn a policy, we wanted to learn a safety constraint on the fly. And uh, that is a problem statement. I wanted to spend the uh, rest of the talk uh, based on this. So uh, from this point, I wanted to a little bit talk about the mathematics. I know that's a little bit uh, boring to uh, talk about the math in a presentation, but uh, please uh, bear with me and I will try to uh, 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 minimize the notion of the mathematics uh, and uh, uh, make sure to convey the point of the joint learning uh, clearly. So uh, to make progress, the problem of unknown, unknown uncertainty and learning safety constraint, I wanted to introduce the notion of the signal temporal logic. So uh, people with the formal method uh, background have a lot of uh, interest on signal temporal logic. So signal temporal logic are the formalism 
that we can specify some situation, some temporal uh, situation of the signal. For example, I provided some example. For, for example, in the last line, it says that uh, for all times between zero and three, a signal or some value of the signal should be less than five and simultaneously the y should be uh, greater than zero. So these are some formalism that we can specify the safety constraints. So uh, this is uh, comes from the formal method community. And uh, by using the signal temporal logic, we can specify some specification or some safety constraint and then apply it to the reinforcement learning setup. So that is the signal temporal logic that help us to uh, mathematically uh, formalize the notion of the constraints. And uh, for the signal temporal logic, we have some uh, grammar and some uh, quantitative semantic that shows how well a signal satisfy a safety constraint. So for example, we have two signal, one signal uh, satisfy some safety constraints better than the other one. So it's actually help us to uh, shows to what extent, to what degree, uh, a signal satisfies a safety constraint. It's good that uh, uh, it, it shows us how well a signal uh, uh, meets the specifications. So we use the parametric signal temporal logic. So the idea of the parametric signal temporal logic is uh, PSCL is the extension of the signal temporal logic where we only have some structure or template of the signal temporal logic. And we choose this one uh, because it gives some sense about what the safety specification is. So we know what the template is and we are trying to learn the parameters uh, of the signal temporal logic in order to satisfy safety constraints. So the only assumption that we have, of course, this is, uh, kind of big assumptions, but uh, to us, it's actually a way to make uh, progress toward the problem of unknown, unknown uncertainty. So we assume that we have some sense about the safety constraint. We do not exactly know what the safety is, but we have something, uh, we know something about the safety. And uh, that's why we use the parametric STL. And our goal is to find those uh, parameters as RL interacts with the environment. So RL versus constraint RL, I just wanted to again summarize that uh, we are trying to convey here. So RL is a, a trial and error setup that an agent tries to maximize some notion of the reward function, but constraint RL, we have some constraints such as a safety constraint we introduced at the beginning for various application, such as autonomous driving, robotics, and we are trying to satisfy those safety constraints. So I need a little bit piece of uh, mass again. So in order to uh, quickly find the safety parameters of safety constraint, we need some uh, paradigm for the optimization that works in a real world very quickly. So uh, because we are trying to work uh, in a real world environment, in a real time, we need to uh, very quickly find the parameters of the safety constraint. So we use the Bayesian optimization. So Bayesian optimization is a technique that aims to find uh, the optimum uh, global or the minimum of an objective function that is expensive to evaluate, very non-convex and uh, non-linear. Uh, and we use the idea of the Bayesian optimization to find those parameters of the safety constraint that I have already talked about. So what is the approach to solve this kind of problem? So uh, when we talk to machine learning, AI, RL, so uh, those are uh, paradigms are nothing than the optimization problem. So all, all the techniques that uh, people talk about has some optimization. And uh, we are trying to solve this problem them, joint learning uh, problem using a technique that is called the bi-level optimization. I will introduce it in a, a next slide. But 
we uh, mathematically uh, formalize this problem as a bi-level optimization. So the bi-level optimization is one optimization is uh, nested into another optimization loop. So for example, if we have just uh, finding the RL setup, we just have one uh, uh, setup optimization problem and our goal is to find the policy. Here we are aiming to jointly learn the policy and also safety constraint as well. So we argue here that safe policy depends on the constraint and also constraint depends on the policy as well. Therefore, we use the bi-level optimization that aims to jointly learn not only the policy, but also the safety specification as well. And the only assumption here is and the only assumption is we have only some sense about the safety. We don't exactly what the safety is, uh, but we have some sense about the safety. We know the template of the safety, but we don't exactly know what the safety constraint is. And I skip from the formulation, but uh, uh, this is the idea of the bi-level optimization. So in general, when we wanted to solve some uh, problem that uh, depend to each other, we use bi-level optimization. So uh, let's start with uh, learning the parameters of the safety constraints. So uh, we use Bayesian optimization in the upper level optimization. So uh, by the way, so uh, bi-level optimization has two level, upper level, and also the lower level. For some reason, for the upper level, we solve the safety constraint learning or the parameter of the safety constraint uh, in the upper level optimization of the bi-level optimization. And uh, for the parameter learning, we have some objective function. I skip from the mass, but we aim to uh, minimize the misclassification rate uh, of, uh, of the parameter learning for the safety. So uh, the key idea here is what is the connection between safe constraint learning and also the RL learning? When agent interacts with the environment, it uh, produces some data. So we use those data, which is called a, a rollout data or a trajectory of the agent that interacts with the environment. And we use those data to learn the safety constraints. So uh, we have a lot of work that aims to learn constraint from data here, the data comes from the interaction of the RL with the environment. And that's how we connected learning of the safety constraint with the RL. So RL interact with the environment. Using uh, that data, it introduces, it uh, produces some data. And by using those data, we're trying to uh, optimize the parameter of the safety constraint. That's the whole idea uh, of uh, the framework. For the lower level optimization problem, which is the policy learning, we kind of adapt uh, some uh, paradigm of the reinforcement learning and incorporate the logic uh, in, uh, in, uh, in to the reinforcement learning setup. I skip from uh, the idea of uh, TD3. So we kind of adapted uh, the idea of the TD3 for, uh, for some reason, in order to incorporate uh, the STL logic, the safety constraint, uh, so that we can uh, solve the joint optimization problem. So uh, the idea of the TD3 structure is we are interested to maximize some notion of the reward function, JR, subject to some safety constraint. And the whole idea is to introduce some uh, Lagrange uh, multiplier method that uh, kind of convert the constraint optimization problem to unconstrained optimization problem. First, I wanted to introduce a TD3 structure and then I uh, provide information about what is our contribution. So that's the idea of the TD3 structure. And the reason that we uh, choose this paradigm of RL for our joint learning problem is it can handle some uh, constraint. So JC is some cost that imposes it to the system and you wanted to use that one 
as a safety constraint problem. I skip from the mathematics behind the TD3 structure. So there are some reasons that uh, people introduced another critic network to, over, uh, to overcome our estimation uh, of the reinforcement learning. Uh, let's skip from uh, those parts. But the main contribution of our work is to incorporate the logic into the uh, TD3. And we introduced the idea of the logically constrained TD3. So once we have some sense about the safety constraint, we incorporate those knowledge uh, using the first order logic, such as the STL, into the reward function of the TD3. And we introduced the idea of the logically constrained uh, TD3. So, uh, so another thing that uh, you wanted to do is uh, incorporate some human feedback mechanism into our framework. Uh, the thing is, when RL interact with the environment, our goal is to get benefit from the trajectory of the RL, such as the trajectory of the state action. And we need a human to label those uh, data sets in order to uh, find the safety constraint. So we trying to uh, minimally use the feedback from human in order to label the trajectory of RL as a safe or unsafe. And then uh, this rational goes to the parameter learning or safe learning uh, framework. So uh, the ultimate goal is to use data uh, for RL that interacts with the environment and the human kind of help us to label those uh, data and uh, these things goes uh, for the outer loop of the optimization which is the safe, learn uh, uh, safe specification learning. So this I think just 15 minutes, I just wanted to skip from some uh, mechanism, uh, how we uh, calculate the feedback from mechanism uh, and how we incorporate the feedback into the uh, RL loop. But that is the big uh, framework and the whole idea of all of the things that I discussed so far. RL agent interacts with the environment and produces some rollout traces, some trajectory of the interaction with the environment. And then we uh, get uh, benefit from some human expert labeling. So human says that uh, this trajectory is safe, uh, this trajectory is unsafe. We have some uh, data based on the human label uh, uh, process. And then we try to learn some safety specifications from the data that comes from interaction of the RL with the world. And we continue this process, we continue this upper level optimization and the lower level optimization until we reach out to an equilibrium uh, so that we find the optimal safety constraint and optimal safe policy. Uh, that's the whole idea. So in uh, typical RL, we are just interested to find a policy. Here we are trying to also find a safety constraint, optimize safety constraint, but using the data that RL has produced for us. And that's the idea of the joint learning framework. So just wanted to show how it works uh, for a uh, couple of uh, case study using safe uh, gymnasium uh, framework. So. Uh, I have three case study. I just wanted to skip uh, one of them, uh, focus on a little bit complex problem. Uh, so for example, here our goal is to navigate uh, the red agent toward a goal, which is the green one. And starting from initial random set. So the goal is uh, to avoid uh, colliding with the blue dots. And we have some sense about the uh, safety constraint. We don't exactly know what are the locations of uh, these blue dots, uh, but we translate uh, the location into some uh, signal temporal logic uh, language. So uh, we don't know what the X and Y coordinates of the obstacles and 
uh, here we have eight obstacles. Therefore, we have 16 uh, safety constraints. We only know what is the sh uh, uh, template, what is the structure of the safety constraint. And our goal is to find a policy that works in a safe way. So uh, we don't know what the safety is. We are interested to find a safe RL policy. That's the idea of the, uh, these uh, cases. Study. And the half cheetah is uh, uh, one of the famous uh, benchmarks in reinforcement learning uh, uh, setup. So uh, the goal is to apply torque on the joints uh, of the half cheetah to uh, run in the forward uh, direction to uh, kind of uh, maximize some uh, notion of the reward. So again, we know some template of the safety constraint. We do not exactly know uh, uh, what are the parameters of the safety constraint? So that's the problem uh, set up. And our goal is to find the uh, safe policy. For the evaluation, we consider two little bit, I think, interesting uh, baseline to compare our results. So first is the unconstrained RL policy optimization in an environment in which safety constraints are known. So uh, for the first baseline, we assume that uh, we are using unconstrained enforcement learning, but we uh, uh, do not know what are the constraints. For the baseline two, we use constrained enforcement learning policy optimization, uh, and we assume that we do know the safety constraint, and we wanted to uh, gauge uh, the effectiveness or approach to the case where we do know what the safety constraints. So our goal is to find safe policy optimization and also uh, parameter synthesis of the safety constraints. So uh, I just wanted to go uh, quickly through the uh, results. And uh, once we go through the results, we can understand that the, uh, effectiveness of our, our, our approach is very, very close to the case that we are aware of the safety constraint. And uh, these plots shows that and our approach works very aligned with the case that we are aware of the fully template and also the parameters of the safety constraints. Uh, this table kind of summarizes uh, uh, the, uh, the previous uh, plots in a quantity. We, I just wanted to skip, and uh, that is also is aligned with. Uh, I just said that uh, our approach is kind of work very, very close uh, to the situation that we are aware of the fully parameters of the safety constraints. So in terms of the result, we can kind of conclude that joint learning of the policy with uh, safety constraints uh, works well and uh, kind of the results are uh, similar uh, to the situation uh, of we uh, know the safety constraint. So there are some uh, limitations to solve the, the problem of unknown, unknown uncertainty and you know, uh, safe learning constraint when we don't know the safe constraint. So we are a little bit relying on the human feedback in order to provide the ground rules of the uh, agent interaction with the environment. Also, we assume that we have some a template of the safety constraints, um, uh, but there is no guarantee of the safe uh, policy, unfortunately, uh, which is uh, some of the limitation of this one. Just in two minutes, I wanted to highlight uh, the works that we recently, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, presented at uh, NORIPS uh, last year. So uh, there are a lot of works that aims to kind of combine uh, the idea from the foundation models and reinforcement learning. So all of us are familiar with how it works, uh, what the foundation model is, but uh, there are a lot of opportunities to uh, uh, find a synergy between uh, decision-making under uncertainty and a large language model. I just wanted to highlight uh, our work, which was the idea of the LLM's augmented contextual bandit. So uh, uh, in this work, we have tried 
to provide the uh, context in the contextual bandit for those who are uh, familiar with the idea of the contextual bandit. And we just uh, provided the context in the contextual bandit into a large language model version uh, four. And we try to have a richer representation of the context using a large language model. And compared to other results, we find that it's it leads to a more uh, better uh, informed uh, decision if we reach a, uh, if we have a richer representation of the context uh, using the large language model. So we have the chance uh, presented this one as uh, in the workshop uh, last year at uh, New Orleans. So with this, I wanted to wrap up the presentation uh, a little bit in 40 minutes, which is good. and. Uh, open the floor for the questions. Thank you so much.